Hi everyone, today we're going to be painting the largest gouache painting I've ever done and talk about how large can you paint gouache. We're going to do these gorgeous blooming trees. We'll talk about staining our surfaces and also drawing with the brush and how to get accurate proportions. We'll be blocking in different colors and talking about color mixing and color theory. So I hope you enjoy this tutorial that we'll go through together. I'm going to try um, something that I've seen Jared Cullum do, which is to start out by kind of killing the white by um, just creating a big wash over the surface of the panel. And um, one thing that I just think is really interesting is that I've over the years heard so many people kind of mention that perhaps there's a limit to the size that you can paint in gouache. And I find that really fascinating and interesting. Um, I know historically that a lot of illustrators illustrated um, some of the great illustrations of the golden age with gouache. Um, but that said, it seems like some people, um, you know, in online forums, it's a frequently asked question, how big can I paint in gouache? And I'm not sure why that would be a constraining issue. Um, and so I kind of always ignored it. But uh, one thing that I noticed recently is um, a great gouache and oil artist that is really doing great work right now is uh, Gareth Jones. And I noticed that in his uh, FAQs on his website and social media, he mentions that he uh, paints with gouache unless he's painting 8x10 or larger, in which case he uses casein. And so I thought that that was just kind of really an interesting statement, and I don't know why that is. So today we're actually going to be painting on the largest surface that I've ever painted on, which is an 8x10 uh, panel of illustration board here using gouache. I'm going to paint this scene out in front of me of these blooming trees and I've actually painted uh, several scenes of this copse of trees before. Um, if you saw the video I did comparing using a yellow underpainting versus just stark white um, and kind of talking about James Gurney's use of the yellow underpainting and what does it actually do. Um, it was these trees just from a different angle uh, down the way. And uh, also, if you remember, when I was painting Tiny last year, um, I painted uh, one of these trees right next to me. So letting this illustration board dry, I'm also going to start um, blocking in my drawing. And to keep things similar to how I might um, do something in oil paint, because a lot of times people ask what's the difference between oil paint and gouache or obviously there are different mediums but one thing that I would often do in gouache is to uh, maybe draw my drawing with a pencil but today I'm going to use a brush so something that I have noticed uh, Jared Cullum doing in addition to killing the white a lot of times he seems to uh, favor drawing with a bright color. So we're gonna dip into alizarin crimson and we're gonna draw with the brush. I'm gonna put in kind of the ground plane here, horizon line. Something like that. And I'm wanting to, you know, feature maybe like the second two thirds of this picture uh, with, for this portrait of these trees. And I'm gonna bring the top of this tree up pretty close to the top of the page and just kind of earmark where I see things happening here. And then there's a second tree that kind of overlaps like so. And we'll put in um, approximation for these trees and I can always kind of move things around I'm not going to go too heavy in drawing into the sky because I'm going to keep the sky relatively plain. Um, now we have some trunks and things, and that was really what attracted me to 
I think I need to bring this down a little bit more, attracted me to this scene was the uh, kind of gnarled and mangled old looking trunk on this tree. And it really reminded me a little bit of some of Vincent van Gogh's paintings. There's a amazing painting of some olive groves, olive trees that he painted while he was in um, the asylum. And uh, he painted that at the same similar time that he painted Starry Night, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And um, there's a really amazing painting that I've always admired that hangs in the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, which is not too far from me. And so uh, I really enjoy that. I'm kind of looking at the division of shapes here, trying to get, um, even though these are natural and organic shapes, um, I'm trying to look at kind of the shapes that I see the negative space between these two trunks. Um, and just observing that, that this branch comes out here. And the beauty of, you know, doing something like this, obviously I can correct things as I go along. But for instance, I see that I need to kind of probably bring this out a little bit more. And we're not gonna, we're not gonna get too hyper detailed with the drawing because I'm gonna kind of draw, draw with paint. So these are the two trees that I really wanna focus on. And I wanna draw a juxtaposition to some of these other trees that are not in bloom. So right now, for instance, again, I'm looking at these negative shapes and there's a tree over here and just using water to keep things fluid. And then there's another tree that overlaps it over here. And these trees are not in bloom. And so I kind of want to draw a juxtaposition between where I want the eye to go and this the portrait I'm going to do of this tree of, that's in bloom against just sort of the blase, boring greens that we're seeing over here. And one thing that you want to be cognizant of is that, for instance, I need to bring this tree trunk down a little bit more because it's in front of us. So the closer things are to us, the lower they're going to be in the picture plane. And as I start to put in some of these tr trunks for trees that are down the way, I'm going to need to put the, the bottoms of them uh, not so close and higher up on the page. In fact, I may need to kind of raise this line quite a bit. I believe I do. So that is just sort of the adjustments that we make. But as I look at like where this tree is, I see that actually my horizon line kind of cuts this trunk in half. So we'll just kind of go straight across like this. And this is fine, we'll cover that up. So, but again, like this tree is farther back and so um, it needs to not be quite as low. Again, there's some other tree trunks here and we're just gonna kind of plop these in, but I'm not overly worried about them. But see, like, I'm gonna start this tree up quite a bit and it kind of helps it recede back. And there's more tree trunks back here. And I'm not overly concerned about making these perfect, but just kind of creating that sense of depth. We'll create some more back here. Okay, that's probably good for just like the approximation of where those tree trunks go. And then I'm going to put this second tree here and it is a little bit closer and in front of this one kind of goes up like this now the last thing I used to always forget about this but when you're painting trees or anything like that you might be tempted to think like we're done here but no 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 <laughs> because one of the things that we want to do compositionally is to remember that all of these guys are going to be casting a shadow. Now before I started I did a quick little thumbnail sketch and I'll show you that here in a second. So I did this thumbnail sketch and you can see how loose and uh, kind of wild it is but I was mostly looking for where I wanted to place things but you can see here that we um, really grouped these shadow patterns and this is a strong compositional feature and it helps kind of delineate the, the sky plane and the vertical planes from the horizontal planes. And always 
um, even though this isn't the most you know complex composition by any stretch we're just having fun today the um, you always want to have a mixture of verticals and horizontals if you can there's usually a lot of horizontals in landscape painting so we kind of want to juxtapose that to create some different balance and direction and weight into the painting we're about to do i think i will um, use a larger brush this brush that i um, did the wash with and just block in some shadows like so so we really want and this is why again that that didn't really particularly matter that we drew this horizon line here because we're going to cover that up so we've really got a lot of shadows back in here because they're covered by trees and then up in here and all these shadows we want to group them together this comes here forward and not so much there a little bit back in there and we want there to be like a sense of like dappled light that's coming through something like that not this this will work and we're going to curve this around this way and i'm happy with that i think like this will more or less work and then i'm going to kind of block in just some shadows to remind myself of what needs to get covered tonally speaking we're gonna bring highlights over that. Trees are kind of essentially glorified balls or just random balls. Um, and so when you think about the direction of light and how that's gonna hit the trees, the darker part is gonna be underneath usually because the sun is coming and shining from above. In this case, it's actually shining from this direction. Um, and so underneath these trees is gonna be quite dark at the bottom like so and then the balls are three-dimensional and so inside the trees are going to be much darker as well all right i'm pleased with this for our drawing so let's start covering the panel and so far I'm kind of checking in and i'm not feeling like this is that egregious um, compared to painting a lot smaller in my sketchbook for instance or anything like that let's go over our colors real quick i'm using um, a lizard and chrism permanent by windsor and newton uh, ultramarine blue um, and cadmium free yellow so i'm going to primarily stick to these three colors and then as some extra colors if we need i may dip into um, yellow ochre and possibly Indian red and then of course we're going to be using white so I'm looking at the sky right now and it's mostly a blue sky with some clouds but again I didn't give myself a ton of headroom above the trees the focal, focal point is not the trees but mostly uh, or <laughs> the focal point is not the sky but mostly the trees so I'm gonna kind of come in here with some of this ultramarine blue and add a little bit of water to that. And then let's also add quite a bit of white. A little bit more than that. The sky is quite bright. Get a little bit more water just for coverage and let's start to block this in. And, you know, a little bit of that yellow might show through and kind of warm it up which I think that's kind of the goal of, of this uh, painting, uh, staining the canvas surface. It's not really canvas, the illustration board. Add a little bit more paint to that, a little bit more blue. But it's really the intermingling of, of these colors that's going to create a variety of blue cools, warms, and um, get things mixing visually. I'm gonna bring this down. I'm okay with painting over my edges. I'm gonna add some more white and kind of 
And remember that the sky usually gradates lighter. And I'm gonna bring some of that sky color into the trees. We can always add sky holes later. But I am gonna do that so that we get that sense that the sky is poking through the tree. I'll do that here too. And I can still see those lines. We'll paint over that and it's okay. But again, we want that sense of three-dimensionality that we get looking through a tree, not just that it's a solid thing. And with some of this white, I can kind of suggest clouds a little bit, but again, for this painting, the sky is not that important. And I just wanna, I do this sometimes, I'm not necessarily seeing it, but I wanna think about vignetting um, and trying to keep the sky, the eye from running off the edges. And so I'm gonna darken with a little bit more blue into my, this sky mixture. I'm gonna darken my colors so that it's almost ha serving to like force the eye inward from the corners, from the edges like that. play with those edges and things like that. This is relatively, I'm, I'm, I'm relatively pleased with this. Okay, wash the brush out. And you saw me um, spraying things down to keep my paint moist. And uh, some of this paint has blending medium mixed into it, which um, I like and it does keep it wet, but I didn't quite get my, uh, my blue totally mixed with blending medium. So a lot of times when I'm painting, I wanna think about my darkest darks. And as I'm looking at the scene, really my darkest darks are going to be a lot of the verticals of the tree trunks and probably the interior of some of the trees. So um, that's, that's pretty standard unless the, the light is raking across and hitting the tree trunks. And so there are a few places like that, but because we're in gouache and you could do this in oil too, you can add highlights over the top. And so um, let's go ahead and mix up a very dark color. And my darkest colors, usually you're gonna mix your darkest color from your darkest colors out of the tube. And that is gonna be ultramarine and alizarin. Okay, and that's giving me a very dark purple. And I'm, the complement of purple is yellow. And so I'm gonna mix in some yellow here to desaturate. A little bit more of that. And the problem with the, this yellow is that it is lighter in color. And so it is gonna slightly raise that um, tonal value. So maybe this would be a great time to use some of that yellow ochre, which is not as dark or not as light. And we're getting a very muted, very dark uh, color here. And so let's go ahead and carve in some of these shapes. And I'm just gonna start with our showstopper here. Add a little bit more water to the brush. And actually, as I look at this, it is not that dark, but we can uh, lighten it up as we go. And I'm using right now a one inch brush by Princeton. I really am a big fan of Princeton's brushes. This is a golden Taclon brush. And let's just gonna, I'm just blocking in these. Some of these trees in the background are this dark um, and some of them are catching light and at this point most of the um, most of the uh, wetness from the underpainting is totally dry so I can rest my hand on this no problem the paint's not coming up or anything like that And I'm, I'm willing and able to paint over all these shapes. You might be thinking, what about the background? We will put the background in. It's not gonna be a problem. And the 
Astria as well. So again, so far, I couldn't tell you why uh, 11 by 10 isn't. Um, I'm not. I'm not sensing any any big problems with this. So and again, I'm just going to kind of block in a lot of these tree trunks. We can refine these shapes later. Create that sense of depth. Okay. Now, a lot of the interior of the trees are quite dark, and then so I'm going to block that in too. Oh, I forgot this tree over here. There's a school not too far away, so if you hear chanting and yelling, um, I think they're having a soccer game, maybe. And actually, it sounds like there's a, uh, a protest going on. We're, uh, I'm not too far from the largest street in the state, and so sometimes when there's uh, political events and things like that, uh, there's protests and chanting, and we're also near the local college so that's probably what you're hearing a little bit classic plein air painting <laughs> situation oh man so I'm gonna darken uh, and I diluted that color a little bit so I just need to mix up more paint bringing back in that blue bringing back alizarin and a little bit of that yellow ochre more blue and just kind of working this to get that dull purple darkness here we go and I'm looking now you know I'm, I'm, I'm gonna intermingle here um, and I'm looking at most of the tree is dark and we want to add our highlights over the top of that so I'm going to actually put down a layer of darkness into our main tree. And then we'll kind of come back over it with our lighter tones and colors and things like that. So maybe I could say like, you know, there's there's certain issues that I'm seeing here which is like it's it's uh, difficult to cover this and maybe you know I would just need bigger brushes possibly but um, it's not too crazy I don't think Okay, so relatively pleased with that. I guess I covered a lot of my sky holes, so we'll go back over that. Now the next darkest thing that I'm seeing is the ground plane, the shadows that we covered in here. And so I want to actually uh, mix into sort of this muted purple that we have. I'm gonna add a little bit more blue, um, and then I'm gonna come in with more yellow. And so I'm gonna mix up a very cool, dark, grayish green. And I want to have a lot of water and drop that in. And I'm gonna work around these trunks as much as I can and keep this very wet so that you get this sense of softness that we often have with shadows. And I like to paint with some transparency and um, I know some people do not, and that's fine. I experiment with both techniques. So sometimes 
Um, I don't paint transparent, but I even think like just building it up slowly so that you can um, kind of control where you're at in the process. I like that, right? So I'm okay with going over edges, painting over things I've just painted, repainting them a little bit more opaquely. That's, that's just part of the process for me. So I'm mixing up some more blue, some more yellow, and a little bit of our red. Most mixtures are gonna have combinations of that. And I wanna get this sense of horizontal like we were talking about a minute ago. And so we will just kind of block that in, keep that sense of light that we had. You can see like we've created a very strong sense of light. And to me, that is usually a recipe for success. So the next darkest thing is going to be our background. The, there's kind of a, um, I'll show you here on camera. There's sort of a, um, another patch of trees that are in a, uh, creek bed, but there's sort of a wall of trees um, down the way and as I look at it, you know, it's farther away. It's mostly desaturated There aren't a lot of leaves on the trees yet And so I'm gonna kind of come in with with a gray. Let's take this greenish gray Line it up with a little bit of White Maybe a little bit more let's put some yellow ochre into that and some of our alizarin, such a strong color, and more of this blue. And that's gonna, you know, any combination of your three primary colors, um, and that will give you grays and browns, whether you're using just three like I am today, or you're using a split primary as a lot of planner painters do, which would be like a warm and a cool, um, a warm and a cool blue, a warm and a cool yellow, a warm and a cool red. Um, either way that you slice that, you're going to uh, have some combination of the three primaries, a red, a blue, and a yellow, that will give you grays, blacks, browns. So we're just kind of liberally mixing in I'm trying to tone it down. I think I went a little bit too, um, too light in color. Uh, cut into some of these tree branches. And uh, as I'm painting, this is amazing. The, uh, the protest is going to march right by us, everybody. So this is cool. I see hundreds and hundreds of people walking right towards me. In part two, the protesters march through our scene. We'll talk about layering shadows and adding texture and definition to your painting. So click here to watch that video or here to watch other art-related videos. Remember, you have a voice that matters. Go be creative. I'll see you next time.